Um, I want to welcome everyone back to the Funk Med Nation podcast. I'm Dr. Steve Noseworthy, your host. And today, my guest is Tim Katke. Now, you might recognize that name because he's the vice president of sales for Apex Energetics, who is one of the top nutraceutical companies in the functional medicine space. But what you might not know is that Tim is one of the principals who started the supplement giant Metagenics back in the day, and Tim and his family started that back in 1983. He served in many positions over the years, starting as sales rep, being transitioned into both regional and national sales manager before ending his career as vice president of sales and of strategic accounts. In 2013, 2014, and you can correct me on this, Tim, family sold Metagenics, and after a year off, Tim joined Apex Energetics as vice president of sales, and he has served in that role ever since. And I've had the pleasure of knowing you, Tim, since about 2014, and I can testify that this is a, a man of great integrity and great character. Tim, it's so very great to have you with me today. Well, thank you, Dr. Noseworthy. I, I really appreciate those comments, and it's so nice to be with you as well. Um, well you Call me Steve, please. Okay, Steve. So one of the things that is we saw Metagenics was sold in 2009. I continued oh. to work there until the end of 2013. I got you. I took a year off and then I started with Apex in 2015. And I think my second week at Apex, I met you and all the rest of the Apex educators uh, yeah. in, in January 2015. So yeah, uh, that's kind of the history with, with that. So yeah. Very nice. Yeah, to be. I do. Listen, I, I do want to talk about your history with Metagenics and how you transitioned in Apex. But, you know, when when I reached out to you and asked if you'd be a guest and you sent me your bio, you said something that just tickled me to death. You said, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it's many close. You said that you've never created a resume resume because you've never applied for a job. <laughs> like, yeah. how does that work? How does that work in today's world? Uh, today it's, it's, uh, you don't usually, um, have a career as long as I've had it in the same industry with the, with only one or two companies. It's not usual. I have a friend that, um, I was just talking to him, a young guy that, that I know. And, and he was saying to me, he says, that doesn't happen anymore. He, like he's, he was working for Firestone and he got recruited by, um, Sprouts, and uh, now he's being recruited by Whole Foods. And you know, there's all these different things that happen. And it's unlikely that people stay in the same business in the same company for so many years. So yeah. I, I never did create a resume. And uh, I've been uh, since 1980, I've been working in the field of nutritional functional medicine. Uh, so it's uh, it's quite a blessing to be able to be in this space for that long. Um, really enjoyed my time here. Yeah. Yeah, you also said in in that brief bio that you uh, you didn't go to college. What did you do? What did you do between graduating high school and then um, starting to work in the nutraceutical industry? And I know you didn't start with Metagenics. That's obvious. No, no. Well, I had a number of different things. You know, my family, my father was in the construction business, and he built homes for a living. And so, out of college, I was a I was a carpenter for a little while. Realized I hated that. Um, fortunately, some guys just love to work with their hands. Uh, it's just not me. Um, I, I was worked in a number of different odd jobs until um, until 1980 when I started to work in the nutritional business. Um, so those four years after I graduated high school was a number of different things. And uh, I remember one November uh, nailing trusses onto the roof of a house in the cold in Wisconsin days and slamming my finger with a hammer and thinking to myself, I'm never, ever, ever going to do this again. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's bad enough when you do that when it's not sub-zero temperature, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyways, that's that's what happened. And, and we got involved in the nutritional business back in um, my family. All my whole family did back in the late 70s. And, and how that occurred, it was my brother, my oldest brother, Jeff, um, he had developed a, a liver condition, a liver disease. And and he'd gotten really quite sick with that, um, very low energy, um, just didn't feel well. We were yeah. all living in Wisconsin at that time. And so we went, uh, he went from doctor to doctor to doctor to try to find a solution for this liver dysfunction and the lack of energy that he had and uh, uh, couldn't get a real good answer. He eventually went to a world-class medical facility and the doctor's uh, prescribed, well, his energy level was down because his liver is compromised. And as yep. you well know, the liver is a storage depot for glycogen and sugars. Anyways, 
uh, um, so his energy levels were really, really down. And the doctor pres prescribed hard candy. He said, buy a bag of hard candy. And when you feel like your energy is, is going down, suck on hard candy to get your blood sugars up. Hmm. And he thought to himself, that's really can't be the solution to this condition. And um, he's a product of the 60s. And one of his hippie friends that was eating macrobiotic diets recommended some supplements. And he went on this a liver supplement and a B complex and a number of things. And eight weeks later, he's feeling normal again. And he thought, wow, this is just remarkable. Everybody needs to know about this. So he went and contacted the company that made those products. And long story short, he got into this business and negotiated a, an agreement where he could be the um, he could distribute these formulas in Southern California. And so that's how uh, we got involved in the nutrition business. Um, so anyways, that that was a company that was called Nutridyne. And uh, that was Nutridyne. Pardon me. That, that was Nutridyne. Yeah, that was Nutridyne. This is before Metagenics. And Nutridyne is a different company than the current Nutridyne. I just want to make that really clear. There's a company in Minnesota right now that's called Nutridyne. That's not who I'm referring to at all. This is a different company. Yeah. Um, at any rate, Nutridyne was, uh, we went to work for Nutridyne. Um, you know, we bought the distributorship. My family came out one by one. Uh, the customer service was my mom in the spare bedroom of my brother's house. The warehouse was the garage, and my dad was the shipping department. And the four boys were the sales department and we went out and told our story and we became really successful and it went really well. And then uh, late, uh, early 1983, that company was sold, Nutrient was sold to a, an investor that really didn't have the same type of a commitment or belief system in this. And, and uh, the products did, began to change. Mm. We found that they were changing and they weren't really what we thought they were. They weren't meeting the label claim. And so my brother did a number of analytical tests on the products and sat down with uh, with the family and said, you know, we've got a problem. These products aren't what we thought they are. We've got an option. We can either go our separate ways and find another way to make a living because we can't morally or ethically continue to sell the products like that. Or we could pool our resources and start our own company. So that was how Metagenics was started. We decided to pool our resources, start our own company, we came up with the name Metagenics. Um, meta in Latin means new, and genics is beginnings. So Metagenics was a new beginning for our family, and that's how we named the company. That's very cool. Yeah. So very cool. Anyways, that's how it started. So I, I mean, you bring up something that's um, a question that I have as a practitioner, and I and I'm sure other practitioners have the same question. Um, and every once in a while, you'll see in the media reports about. Um, you know, false label claims and studies that are done where someone has taken a look to see whether or not what's in the supplement is actually on the label. How prevalent, and I'm kind of jumping because I want to come back and talk about the history and some of the challenges that you guys faced in starting Metagenics and then growing that company. But just in general, how prevalent is it that even brand name manufacturers of supplements that a lot of the docs in functional medicine are using, how often is it that the contents are not matching the label. I think that since the um, the new laws that came in, manufacturing laws, the GMP uh, laws that have come in, it's yeah. less likely that you're going to find that happening than it did in the past. In the early days, it was kind of like the wild, wild west where, you know, anything was possible. But I think right now, um, most, of, most of what you find on the label, you're going to find in the product. It comes now. It comes down more to ingredient selection, the raw materials that you choose, and the bioactivity of those raw materials. Do they really have the effect that you're looking for? That's the critical factor. It's not the not the whether or not you have things on the label that you that you want to have. It's whether or not the ingredients that you choose have the ability to have the effect that that um, some right. of the ingredients have been studied to have. And are you talking there then about, and we're kind of getting off track, but it's all relevant and, and I think good information. Are you talking about standardization for bioactive molecules? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I, I think you can look at different uh, herbal contents or different compounds that have specific bioactive components to it and whether they're standardized to the effect that you need them to have, whether there's enough of those materials. Like for instance, 
if you're ma manufacturing, let's just use berberine. Is a berberine is a compound that you use in helping to uh, support patients' blood sugar um, uh, aspects. You can find different grades of berberine. You can find, um, you know, a X amount, like a, a X amount of dollars per kilo berberine, or a much more expensive kilo per kilo berberine. Yep. And uh, depending upon the raw material you choose, will depend upon the effect that you get in most cases, not in all cases, but the raw material. So you want to make sure that the ingredient selection is the proper selection that you're going to get the best effect um, uh, from the the, the uh, products that you manufacture. Yeah, and I know you're you're probably speaking right now from your perspective as the vice president of sales of Apex, and I know you guys go in my opinion, above and beyond in terms of like quality control, quality assurance. Was that something that was on your radar back when you guys started Metagenics? Or is it something that came part of your ethos after a period of time? I and mean, it kind of sounds like the way Metagenics started, is you guys were concerned about, you know, the integrity of your products from the get-go. Yeah, for sure. That was how it was founded. We couldn't, I mean, my brother's um, liver condition was completely mitigated and modified by nutrition. And this is something that, you know, he felt like, well, everybody needs to know about this. And yeah. it's not going to work if you don't have the high quality product that's good. Yeah. That's, you know, if you don't have what you think you have in the product. So quality was the foundation for what Metagenics was built. Quality is the foundation for how Apex operates as well. Um, it, the, the, there's so many similarities to the two companies. Um, uh, and quality is the guiding principle. We often said at Metagenics that the, the doctors that we sell our products to aren't really our customers, the patients are our customers, and the patient's best interest must be met, because if we, if we scrimp on an ingredient or we scrimp on a manufacturing principle, the patient's not going to get the results that, that they're hoping for from the doctor that you know, is prescribing it. Yeah. Similar, we have a motto at Apex, patient health comes first. When we think about uh, our patient's health, that comes first. It comes before um, cost savings. It comes before any other aspect. It, it is the guiding principle on every decision that's made at the company. And it started way back in Metagenics. And I was reason I came to Apex. It was so similar in the in the belief systems. Yeah. Um, you know, my brother was sick. Had that condition. That's how he got into into got us all into this um, nutritional business. The owner of Apex was similar. He had his own personal health challenge. That's how he got into it. It was a very similar story, very parallel story. Yeah. So, I mean, for someone who's practicing in the trenches, a lot of companies will have labels on their products that, or at least information on their website or in a handout that says that they follow good manufacturing principles. Um, how is the average Funk Med practitioner going to know how much money a given supplement company invests in the raw materials to have some assurance that they're getting the highest quality bioavailable product? That's a really good question because it's very difficult to look at a, at a capsule or look at a bottle of vitamins from a different manufacturer and understand what true quality is. Um, there are a number of different brands that market directly to practitioners. Mm -hmm. And the perception is that those brands are superior brands. You know, that the, the, there's a lot of care that goes into the manufacturing of those products. Um, you know, the, I, get, I think the only true way you're going to really know is you know the people behind the decisions yeah. Um, yeah. that that um, that go into the manufacturing of a, of a, a product or a, or a service. If the people are, are are the decisions that are made by the people that are making those decisions. Um, you have to trust that is probably the best way to know. Yeah. Also, there's analytical tests, there's assays that you can, you know, people can be provided, all different sorts of information that can be provided. But uh, I think really understanding the, the belief and the, and the principles of the people that are making the decisions is a core value that, that yeah. uh, will help. Is it a case where you get what you pay for? And in other circumstances where um, a manufacturer might, price their product as a premium product, even though the quality doesn't back that up? Yeah, there, there can be that circumstance. I mean, I, I think that um, generally um, in the professional brands, 
you know, people are looking at finding the most economical way to provide high quality ingredients that are going to have an effect uh, on patient outcomes. Yeah. Because if you're if you're marketing to doctors and you were educating doctors and they understand specifically how to apply those principles into their practice and help their patients, if the products don't work, if the patient doesn't get the results, your business strategy is is doomed. So you have to have the ingredients that are in your formula. It's really going to have an effect on improving patient outcomes. And if they don't, uh, doctors like you are not going to go back and, and, yep. and use those supplements on an ongoing basis. So you have to have, you know, cost, cost is an issue, but you have to have quality as the, as the guiding principle in order to get consistent reproducible results. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I totally believe that. Um, let me circle back around to the metagenic stuff and, and ask you, um, what were some of the major challenges that you faced, either you individually or, or as a family group, in, in launching it? And I would imagine that back in the 80s, was it 83 that you started metagenics, right? Correct, yeah. I mean, and I've been involved in functional medicine now for about 15 years. So you're going back even... 20 years before I got involved. And I've seen a lot of changes in the functional medicine landscape. Like it, I, I kind of imagine you and your family as being this bunch of visionaries and entrepreneurs that could see things that most people couldn't. It, like, was it, was it a struggle for you to talk to doctors about nutrition from the perspective that you guys held? Or was your knowledge and understanding of all that kind of at the same level as, as your marketplace being practitioners, was there a mismatch between those or do you feel like you guys were really ahead of the curve? I think that, that um, we were committed to this type of medicine as, you know, they called it in back in those days, alternative medicine. Yeah. And then they changed it to complementary alternative medicine because they really didn't want it, it to be discussed as alternative medicine because it's really not an alternative. It's a different, it's a complementary way to do a medicine. And then it continued to integrate into other, other names, integrated medicine, functional medicine, and so on. Um, so I think that, you know, the principles we believed in strongly about this form of medicine and then who we aligned ourselves with uh, was really important from the science perspective. So back in the day, my brother um, in this in the seventies, even before we I started, uh, saw this uh, speaker um, that was from the University of Puget Sound, uh, lecturing about nutritional compounds and the effect that it had on on mitigating health concerns. A whole whole host of different things, and he was a young professor at University of Puget Sound with a big red beard and a big red afro, and his name was Dr. Jeffrey Bland. <laughs> and Dr. Jeffrey Bland, who, if you don't know, he's well known now as the father of functional medicine. Um, we aligned ourselves with a strategic partnership with him, and we began sponsoring educational events with him all around the country. And uh, he was a, a you know, a, a um, visionary, brilliant uh, scientist that really understood the uh, the science of nutritional medicine. And and uh, so I think that we were ahead of the of the curve because of our alignment with doctors like Dr. Bland. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Yep. There. Um, so that was, I think that was a really important uh, uh, strategic partnership that we had that went on through the entire length of Metagenics. Yeah. And I, I really think that, um, you know, th there's other doctors, too, that we aligned ourselves with, but he was probably the most uh, well-known and uh, the one that we had the longest relationship with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how much changed the field of functional medicine during your tenure at Metagenics? I mean, did you see, did you see the, the significant and rapid changes in the industry the way that we have in the last decade or so? And, and what I mean by that is that um, you know, when I started teaching for you and for, for Apex 2008-ish, um, the, the demographics of the people attending the functional medicine seminars that we taught is, was radically different than what we, what we see today, like radically different. So what, what did you see, say, in the first 20 years with Metagenics in, in that regard? 
Well, in, in the beginning uh, with Metagenics, it was primarily chiropractic that was involved in this nutritional medicine. There was very, very few medical doctors that were interested or had any type of natural medicine approach. So chiropractic has kind of, in, in, in some to some level, acupuncture has been the pioneers in this business. So right. most of our business was with chiropractic doctors and I think back in those times, it was it was quite profound. They were quite the pioneers because in the 80s, a chiropractor uh, could specialize in chiropractic and in personal injury and workman's comp and the insurance and chiropractic business uh, industry was aligned really well. And, and, and doctors of chiropractic were making really great incomes doing that. But then there was a subset of doctors that really wanted to, to explore the natural medicine aspect and really focus more on chiropractic as it relates to other aspects of, uh, of healing, including nutrition and diet and lifestyle and so on. So they were really kind of the pioneers. And that has completely changed uh, over the years. Chiropractic still by far has more doctors that are active functional medicine practitioners but the, the amount of medical doctors and the amount of internists and other specialties that have come in to this field of functional integrated medicine is just remarkable. Yeah. I remember I, I started, when I started, I had San Diego, Las Vegas, or, um, and Palm Springs was a territory that I had, and there's two medical doctors in that whole territory. Now there's hundreds of medical yep. doctors that are doing this type of business. So the landscape is really modified and changed and secondarily, the way that you integrate uh, nutrition into a practice is dramatically changed. In the early days, there was not a lot of uh, diagnostic work. Uh, you know, many of the doctors would use a muscle testing technique, applied kinesiology techniques, and that was one of the ways that they would help to determine the nutritional needs of their patients, which at the time was remarkable. It still is remarkable. It's a, it's a, it's a modality that many doctors use very right. successfully. Right. But we've also integrated into more objective measurement tools to determine whether these this uh, these nutritional strategies are working. And I think that's a big shift because it's more medically accepted. Blood chemistries are used to, as, as you know, you teach a whole course about how to interpret blood chemistries from a nutritional pr perspective, yep. how to understand patterns and so on. So I think that's a big shift that's occurred from the diagnostic aspect into into where we are right now. Yeah, and you know, I've seen the same thing in the last 15 years when I first started teaching. If if we had a medical doctor in a in a classroom or on a weekend seminar, that was unusual. Now it's unusual not to have a couple of MDs, some nurse practitioners, and some PAs. I mean, it's unusual to not. So I I've seen that change <clears throat> as well. And the other thing, Tim, that I've seen is um the sophistication of the people attending the seminars. Um, and you know, now that I'm thinking about it, the other major change is like, you know, we're seeing a lot of, ever since I've been involved in teaching, there's always been a handful of students from any local college, whether it was chiropractic or acupuncture or naturopathic. And a lot of these docs coming out, they're actually starting their careers with a, with a solid understanding of human function and physiology and the applications of different functional medicine strategies. And, and it seems to me that, I mean, it sounds a little trite to say, but like the doctor of tomorrow was going to be heads and shoulders above the doctors that are around when I got involved, maybe with the exception of the visionaries and the pioneers. Yeah, for sure. I think that the the doctors graduating, more doctors are, are um, becoming so involved in Understanding more about the science of functional medicine, it's becoming a curriculum. We have, you know, organizations like the Institute of Functional Medicine. You have a number of different organizations that do ongoing CME, continuing education um, uh, trainings on this concept of medicine and so on. And I think it's it's really changed the landscape. I think in part it's changed the landscape because patients demand it. You know, patients yeah. are come to their doctor and they ask about things. They prefer not to be put on a medication. They try would prefer a natural approach first, and I think that has shifted the um, 
desire possibly, or even the focus of some medical practitioners to want to become more involved and understand it. Uh, one, one thing, one doctor told me, he said, you know, I, I, I give my patients options. He's an internist MD that's been involved for a while in functional medicine. And he says, patients come in and, and let's say a patient comes in with elevated cholesterol. You know, I know that diet and lifestyle, I think I can probably help to improve that condition with diet, lifestyle, there's certain natural compounds I could prescribe. And then I could also prescribe a statin drug. And I give my patients options. Right? And the patient comes in and said, well, we could do it two ways. I can give you a medication, medication will lower your cholesterol, it's got some side effects. Insurance pays for that. You know, that's one way that you could go. Or you could go the way I prefer, a natural way. And uh, we could um, change your diet, give you some diet recommendations, some modifications to that, some natural compounds that will help. And insurance doesn't pay for that, but it's, it's a, it doesn't have side effects and it's a much more natural approach. Which would you prefer? And he says eight out of 10 patients will say, yeah, I'd like to try the natural approach. It's yeah. really shifted the mentality. Yeah, and I would say that the sophistication of function of healthier consumers has changed over the years. Like just even thinking about my own practice, the level of knowledge and, you know, some of it has to be corrected periodically, but the amount of information available to people now, as opposed to 15 years ago is dramatically different. And especially with all, you know, big personalities, you know, whether it's Datis Karazian or, or other big name people are doing all these supplements and are not supplements, sorry, summits, and being interviewed in different podcasts and sharing information, um, it to me, it's had a trickle down effect to the point where if I interview a client, like a new prospect as a client, if they haven't heard about things like leaky gut, that's unusual. Whereas 10 years ago, someone would say, well, what's leaky gut? I've never heard of that. I mean, mm -hmm. so I, I see changes throughout all different aspects in the industry, both in the, the quality of people seeking help, the the profile of the doctors that are attending seminars that I and others like me teach, um, the sophistication of the thought process. And now we have, you know, just like you said, in terms of testing and diagnostics, we have things available to us now that, that we didn't even have, you know, say five to seven years ago. So mm -hmm. there's been a lot of rapid changes. But I'm interested back in the days with metagenics, um, what, what kind of conversations led up to the decision for the family to sell? And, and you don't have to share that if that's too private, but I'm, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, well, I think that, um, you know, when we started Metagenics, we, we um, had to help people understand why we existed, what our mission, what our vision was. And, you know, our mission was um, set in a principle that was to improve health and reverse chronic disease by helping people achieve their genetic potential through nutrition. And in 83, genetic potential through nutrition was that was not something that was widely accepted. The concept came from a, a, a article in the 19, early 1980s. It was uh, uh, Dr. James Fries, and he did. He was a professor at Stanford University in immunology, and um, he uh, uh, authored a paper on the on the compression of morbidity, and he talked about organ reserve, mm -hmm. and he talked about the fact that you know, based on different patients have different levels of capacity or organ reserve. And it's likely um, based upon the choices that they make in their life, their lifestyle choices, you know, and he was, the article was saying is you want to grow old, stay healthy and functional all the way into your eighth or ninth decade of life. And then when you pass away, you do it quickly. So your, your function was good. So do whatever you can to maintain your organ reserve. Yeah. And that equated to us is if diet and lifestyle are, can be effective, could that possibly be uh, affecting the way the genes express themselves? And so we believe that in, on every bottle of Metagenics since 1983, it said genetic potential through nutrition. We believe the choices that you made had an effect on your genes. And it's still... I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but like back in the 80s, that was that was like a revolutionary thought. Yeah. So where, yeah. what, what kind of background did you and your brothers have that, that allowed them to make those connections? It just, we actually, this is a paper that, that came out. I think we were exposed by Jeff Bland to this paper. And it was a paper that we studied very closely. And it was one of the things that 
was a guiding principle when we started Metagenics is that if you can take nutritional supplements and modify diet and lifestyle, it will have a positive impact on your morbidity and the quality of your life over the course of it. And the question just came up, what about our gene? Could that be uh, changing the expression of our genes? Could, could that be part of it? And, and we believe that it was, and we just decided that was the stake in the ground that we were going to take. And, and genetic potential through nutrition is the guiding um, um, tagline for metagenics products still is today. Yeah. And, and that's crazy to, to me to think that um, the, there are people that are so smart and tuned in that they can see so far ahead. I, I just uh, a couple of days ago um, interviewed Ari Vigidani for the podcast. And, and we talked about his background and he pointed out that, you know, he started doing his, um, his training in immunology back in the 1960s and his mentor, whom he ended up working for in his lab. And, and I, his name is escaping me right now, but he was saying, he said, Ari, the future of immunology is immune surveillance. And, and we talked about the same, the same thing is that that was a pioneering concept, like the realization or the understanding, like this guy was probably 30, if not 40 years ahead of his time, because, you know, that statement certainly has, has borne out to be true. And, you know, as you and I both know, and probably most people listening to the episode here is, is that, you know, pretty much everything that help happens with your health and your wellness is all phenotypic expression. Right, it's all diet, lifestyle, and environmental influences over your genomic profile, and so it just blows my mind that you guys were talking about that back in the eighties, because the eighties was the eighties to me. That was I call the eighties like the snack well generation. That was the high carb, low fat day, right? And you know you can't get nutrition more wrong than that. And to think that there was a core group of people that were so forward thinking that they were thinking about genetic expression and nutrition in the eighties, it just blows my mind. It, it, it was it's pretty interesting to think back and some of the some of the things that happened like I, I remember being at a trade show and we had underneath metagenics it said genetic potential through nutrition and the doctor came up and just tore me and I just was very upset how dare you you can't influence the genes how dare you say that this is such skin you know and went on and on about it Another example is I, I was a real good friend of mine as a chiropractor in San Diego, and, and uh, he's still working today. And uh, right next to him was a gastroenterologist that was kind of friendly and so on. He said, you should, I, we were the first to come out with a high potency probiotic formula, the probiotic bacteria, lactobacillus, acidophilus, and so on. He wanted me to go and share that with this gastroenterologist, thought it was excellent. And I went in and he, the, the GI doctor was so upset to think that we would be prescribing these billions of organisms that would be live organisms that you prescribe that would have such an effect on gut function. He thought that was crazy, that it was ridiculous, that it was, you know, it was, um, what's the word, charlatanism, and that he threw me out of his office. And now today, you know, every yogurt you have is full of those organisms. That's right. Yeah. It's, and it's really, it's really quite interesting how things have progressed over the course of the years. Well, it's, it's always nice to eventually be vindicated, isn't it? <laughs> I'd like to go back to calling him right now, but uh, I can't remember his name. <laughs> That's right. Find him in the phone book. Um, um, so, so you so guys, what, yeah. So the question was like, at, at what point did you guys start thinking about it might be time for us to, to pass the baton and, and then walk away? And how hard was that, like psychologically and emotionally? It was your baby. Yeah, well, we we developed a business, and then we had partnered. We had a, developed a business in Australia, and the business in Australia and the United States is about the same size. It was a very big business, and and investors, you know, there's many many investors that are looking at this niche in the market. You know, nutrition has been a billion dollar industry for a long time, but the practitioner market or the practitioner niche is something that many investors are looking at. And so we would be contacted on a regular basis, um, asking if we'd want to sell sell the company. And my brother Jeff was the CEO, you know, I was the VP, and we were part of the executive committee. But we had ongoing conversations about selling it. And as we got older, you know, we're thinking about um, you know uh, wanting to develop a retirement strategy. None of the none of the kids really wanted to be into this business. It wasn't something you'd pass down generation to generation. So. 
what would be our retirement strategy. And so we wanted to consider that. Of course, everybody who can't work forever wanted to consider that. Um, but we wanted to find the right investor, the right person, the right partner that would kind of carry our mission and our vision at some level. And so that was a real difficult um, time uh, to try to find the right person. And um, we went through a whole number of different iterations of people interested in negotiations and discussions and so on. And, and finally, you know, we landed on a, a group of people that we thought were good people that um, had the resources to be able to do and invest in the company to bring it to the next level. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I know that uh, I saw a notice. So, so that was the initial sale. I saw a notice last year that um, I think it was Altacore who bought it from you guys. They were, at least there was negotiations, they were going to be bought out by another, um, like a private equity fund or firm. I, I, I don't know if that went through, but I just kind of wonder, um, even though it seemed to be your choice to do that, was it, again, was it emotionally hard to walk away? Because you had built it up, you and your family. And you know, kind of sitting back in retrospect, do you have concerns? Because you had mentioned earlier in our conversation about sometimes, you know, companies change hands or or they grow, and then things start to change, like the commit commitment to quality and and the ethics start to change. Are you, I mean, do you look out at the metagenics that's out there now and go, it's not the same metagenics that we started with? And I, I don't want to say that because I don't want to put you in a position where you're you know, I don't know what your opinion is, but I don't want you to feel cornered that you have to give me an opinion. But um, I mean, what do you think? Like, is it the same, same stuff? Well, nothing stays the same. Everything changes. And I'm not, uh, you know, I think that when we, the initial, um, when we first sold Metagenics in 2009, I continued to work there. I enjoyed working there. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that it's not the same as you know the same commitment you had when you started. You you lose that legacy, but it doesn't mean it's bad. It's just yeah. not the same. And I think that um, right now, Metagenics. Uh, I think that the CEO of Metagenics is awesome. I think he's a really really good man. I think he's got uh, takes a lot of the historical considerations into the decisions he makes, and I think they're doing a really good job. Um, I, the, they were sold to another private equity company. I don't know anything about that company, what's happening with them. I believe that uh, the people that I know at Metagenic still are quality people that are really trying to do the right thing. So yeah. that's um, what, I, what I know about them. I think that, um, yeah, so let's leave it at that. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So what, what about Apex? Um, you know, my experience with Apex is that they are, they may not be the largest company out there, but I think that they've had um, perhaps an indelible impact on functional medicine, not only with the products and the formulas that they bring to the market, but the how functional medicine education has changed, um, you know, particularly under under the guidance of Detis. But what do, what do you think is what do you think Apex's strong point is? What's the best thing about Apex Energetics? Well, first of all, the, it, when when I left Metagenics, I retired, and I really didn't picture myself coming back and working in this, uh, you know, for another company. I didn't know what I was going to do, and I, I, I've always heard of Apex uh, when I was at Metagenics before I came to them, and and um, you know, so when I was contacted to have a discussion about it, I was interested because I always heard about Apex. Apex is main strength is. Um, well, it's a, a very similar strength to Metagenics. It's commitment to quality. It's commitment to education. Those two components define Apex. And I think that there's not another company that does more functional medicine education in the industry commercially than Apex does. Um, you know, prior, post COVID, we were doing 150, 200 events, live events a year around the country, yep. and you were you were speaking at many of them, teaching many of them. And so I think that uh, one of the outstanding things about Apex is taking the concepts and putting them, in, in, uh, putting them into usable principles that doctors can implement in their practice, really clinically relevant principles. I think sometimes um, we forget when you're educating doctors about the science of nutrition, it's got to be converted into clinically relevant principles that they can use in their practice Absolutely. and implement and too often, it's too esoteric, too scientific, not enough clinical application. Apex is the best at the clinical application, the best at putting those principles into practical use. 
And then similarly to how Metagenics had a guiding expert and visionary, Dr. Jeff Bland, Apex has a guiding visionary expert, Dr. Datis Karazi. Yeah. He, it, it's, I think back and pinch myself to think if I have the opportunity to work with two visionary experts in the field of functional medicine, Jeff Bland and Datis Karazi. And, and I really think that, um, that that is another thing that makes Apex really special. Um, I thought I knew a lot when I came to Apex. I, I, you know, I've been in the business for a long time, but understanding Apex's view on autoimmunity, on the science of immune neutral, uh, the science of balancing Th1 and Th2, those yep. compounds was um, was really eye opening to me. So I think that uh, that's kind of a long answer to what I think. But I, I'm very passionate about what we do at Apex. It's a it's an outstanding organization with great products and a great people behind it. The owner of Apex is um, probably one of the nicest men I've ever met, big heart, and also very, very committed to quality. Yeah. Yeah. You can see that pretty much in, in everything that, that Apex does. I, I think it's a hallmark. Um, give me some insight into like the process at Apex, like from from concept to to market, like when when someone, whether it's Detise or someone else, comes up with an idea for a product, like how how does that work behind the scenes, just in a rough sketch? Well, the um, probably I'm not sure the timing because I came in 2015. I think early 2000, late 2009 or maybe eight. Uh, Dr. Krasian and Apex kind of had a partnership. And it's very similar to the process that happened at, uh, at Metagenics in the sense that Dr. Krause, I really believe is a visionary, can see what's happening in, in the field of nutritional science, uh, especially in the terms of, auto, of, of immunity and gut and um, neurology. Those are areas that we do. I think we're, we're extraordinarily, not so different, but exceptional in those areas. Yeah. And the, you get a concept or they read the research, they see um, details about a particular compound, and then they will take that, that and convert it into clinically applicable concepts and then into formulas, into testing those formulas and testing the theory behind those formulas into an actual product. So it goes from a scientific concept or theory into a concept, into an uh, actual formula, into a product, and then it's into the market. And what's, I, I'm sure that there's a range, but what's the average time frame from end point to end point? Oh boy, it can be long. It can be really long. It can be short. You know, it can be, um, uh, so I, I would think from it's, uh, 12 to 18 months from concept to actual product, maybe longer, 24. There's, there are some, you know, ingredients that come out that are, that are just so clear cut that you can go from concept to product pretty quickly. Like a formula we came up with is a short chain fatty acid formula for the gut, um, yeah. which was a pretty short timeline because it was so clear the scientific, um, the, the scientific uh, evidence that short chain fatty acids have a powerful impact on the gut, on the gut microbiome. Are you talking about enterovite or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. enterovite. So I yeah. still think is our most underutilized formula in the in the yeah. whole Apex line. Yeah, it's growing pretty quickly, but it's still I think everybody should be. Um, to, is it is Adaptocrine still the number one product? No, no, Adaptocrine's number three now. I think yeah. uh, trisomal glutathione is our number one product. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so that and the whole sense. concept yeah. behind glutathione and the immune system and and uh, uh, you know. T regulatory self function and the effect that glutathione has on it, plus the master antioxidant effect has made it uh, in the yeah. delivery system. Yeah. Yeah. What about um, what about copycats? I mean, it seems to me that anytime there's a, a pioneer, um, especially when whatever it is that they're pioneering is accurate and true, you end up with a lot of copycats that are just riding your coattails. Yeah, how much how much of that have you seen in the industry without naming names? <laughs> in tons of it, it's you can't. <laughs> I mean, it's there's so many products that came out that were same as Metagenics for less, and the same thing with Apex, same as Apex for less. Yeah. And usually it's stale. 
look at a formula that's really successful and they'll make a formula like it and say, yeah, it's just like theirs, but it's cost less money. So that's the strategy behind it. So that happens all the time. It goes with the business, you know, it goes with. Uh, and so with like, if it does actually cost less money, where are they saving the money? Is it the quality of the raw ingredients? Uh, that's a good question. I don't, I don't really know. Yeah, I, I mean, that, unless they're selling something at no margin, it's got to be because the bottles are bottles and all that kind of stuff. It seems to me that about the only place that you can play is that you can you just choose a lower pricing tier, which means you're getting lower quality. Yeah, it could be. It could be. There, there is. Everybody's in business to make a profit. You know, profits are not. It's not a four letter letter word. You know, it's a yeah. something every every company has to make, and so there's. There's margins and there's a business uh, uh, infrastructure that's set up, and you know yeah. different companies have different infrastructures, different margins, and they make different ingredient selections, have different manufacturing processes. So who knows? We just go that we're the you know we're the you know the originator, and and um, so we believe that the proof is in the pudding. You have experience, and you have uh, many many patients and many many doctors. That have prescribed those formulas on on your side. So, yeah. Where's uh, where's Apex Energetics going? Like, what's next on the agenda? Um, we're continuing to, you know, uh, the whole COVID thing really uh, interrupted our educational process. So we're we're going getting back into our commitment. Part of our of our DNA, you know, our genetic expression is education. We we yeah. just do that, and we haven't been able to do that. Uh, as well as we, we wanted before. We're continuing to work with Dr. Krasian and new concepts. And, and there's a uh, January is going to come out with a whole new concept of, of dealing with um, uh, different aspects of uh, detoxification, supporting patients. There are, there's a whole number of principles that are coming out. So they, well, there's a lot of cool things that are happening. I'm looking forward to that. It just yeah. continues to, to move forward. Yeah. Where do you think functional medicine is going in general? Well, that's a good question. I think that um, I think that functional medicine is is the is continuing to progress, and I think that there's patients are. Let me put it this way: I think that many patients are dissatisfied with the traditional therapies that they have available to them, and they're looking for alternatives. They're looking for a different way, and I think functional medicine fits that fits that part of the market. Because just the principle behind functional medicine, if you, you know, rather than trying to take a medication to suppress a symptom, why not look at restoring function to eliminate the symptom? And that's the principle behind functional medicine. If you can restore function, removing obstacles, then you're gonna have a more natural, effective way of dealing with patients' health concerns. I can't see, I think, um, there's some data that suggests there's two to 300,000 medical doctors that are in transitional medical practice, meaning that they're, they're dissatisfied with their existing method by which they're using um, you know, the, the, the specific way that they are treating patients and looking for alternatives, and many are transitioning into functional medicine. That's just- Where, a, does, that, where does that data come from, Tim? Uh, it was it was something I can't remember the I can't give you the reference on it. It was something that was part of our process that we went through a few years ago. I can't give you the reference on that. Um, I can't remember. Yeah, I mean, if you can dig it up, I'd love to see that. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I mean, you and I have already talked about how um, the demographics of people attending, specifically Apex seminars, has changed over the years and. Practitioners are becoming increasingly more sophisticated, as are healthcare consumers. Um, you know, I, I tend to see, I tend to see the functional medicine community starting to stratify between um, like true experts versus your your run of the mill guy or or gal doing nutritional medicine. Right. Um, and and I think that any practitioner who steps into this arena. Uh, without a commitment to education and without a commitment to partnering with companies like Apex that that really truly value and prize quality control, uh, I think they're just going to fall behind the curve. Yeah, but, I mean that's just my opinion. That's that's where I see things going. Yeah, and um, I think 
One of the things that I want to comment on too, I think that, that, that we have to recognize that there's an Amazon effect in this business. And I think that's one of the things that is um, a challenge um, because what I mean by an Amazon effect is everybody expects to get what they want next day delivered yeah. to their front door. And uh, I think that um, many, um, you know, there's many platforms now uh, that are designed to be patient fulfillment platforms where the doctor can write a prescription, like it's writing to a pharmacy, it goes to this platform and the platform delivers the product right to the patient. Um, I think that it's in, imperative for the survival of this business to keep the doctor's involvement very close and not have it go to direct to consumer type of an approach with supplements. The practitioner brands are complicated and more expensive than the health food store brands in general. And doctors are trained scientifically to understand how to apply those clinically. And once you remove the doctor from that equation and try to go direct to the consumer via Amazon, um, you're really going to have a, a real negative impact on the overall effect of that. And I, I think that that's going to have an adverse effect. And I see some companies and some, like for instance, Pure Capsulations was was bought by Nestle uh, you know, a while back. And bigger bigger companies are coming into the marketplace. And not, not that they're, they're um, ignoring the way it's been, but they're also looking at new ways to do things. And yeah. so I, it's just a very interesting time uh, because of such a, an interest in this field and the fact that it's becoming a very big business. There's a lot more players that are becoming interested in doing this. And I, I just think the whole Amazon effect is affecting everybody. And everybody expects to have it next day at their door. And uh, it doesn't work yeah. that way all the time, you know. Yeah. So on in, on that note, um, I'm going to ask you to to offer some advice to three different types of docs. One would be a doc that's new in practice that wants to get into functional medicine, but they don't have a lot of experience just in, in practice in general. And, and we'll deal with these. Let me get them out and then we'll kind of go back one at a time. Another one would be an established doc been in practice for a while of some kind and wants to get into functional medicine. And then there's the doc who's been in functional medicine, but they're struggling to make it work. So what would you say to the first one? New doc straight out of school, doesn't matter what their credential degree is. They just want to get into functional medicine. What do you, what do you advise them? What do you tell them? Uh, I would tell them to um, immer immerse themselves in functional medicine education. I would say come to our APEX seminars. We've got a whole series of seminars that take you through a whole number of different concepts. Uh, probably some of the best introductory seminars that you'd want to um, is our blood chemistry seminars because it Agreed. teaches doctors to take standard blood chemistries, look at those patterns and interpret them from a functional medicine perspective. So come to those seminars, get involved in those, in those, in that education and learn that. And what you do by doing that, when you come and become an expert in blood chemistry interpretation and applying nutrients to that, you differentiate yourself from so many different doctors in the market that you become in demand because of your expertise. Right. So the more expertise you have, the more in demand you'll have, the more patients will, will, be, will come to you. And so, and also the more fun you're going to have. You know, <laughs> there's, there's, I mean, there's nothing better than learning. One of the things, you know, over my career, over the 42 years I've been in I've had the opportunity to learn so many things. And you, you know, some people say, you know, I've got 20 years experience, when in reality they have one year experience 20 different times. They've never really oh, grown. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. learning. Wow, that's that's profound. <laughs> yeah. It, it, I, I love that statement because you can have 20 years experience one year, uh, you know, one year of experience 20 times or 20 years of experience. And so I just love that concept. And if you're not growing, you're not learning, you know, life isn't exciting. It's not as exciting as it could be. And yeah. so I just think that doctors have an opportunity to continually learn and get new, exposed to new clinical uh, ways to help their patients. It's just an outstanding uh, way of, of, uh, of making a living and being excited about what you do. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I'm, I'm right there, right there with you. What about someone who's been in practice for a while and wants to transition. Like you said, there's a couple hundred thousand uh, 
yeah, a couple of hundred thousand MDs in transition from allopathic or traditional to something that's complementary. So what do you well, tell I, that? I, say that again? What do you uh, tell that person who wants oh, to transition? Well, I think that, you know, there's oftentimes doctors that will get very proficient in a particular aspect of their practice. And they do it over and over and over again. If you're a doctor that's in functional medicine and you're doing well in a particular area, uh, eventually it can get boring just to do that particular area. I, I think just, I think all the advice for all three categories of these doctors is a continual ongoing learning and things change so quickly. The field of nutritional knowledge, they say doubles every X amount of years. I can't remember the quote anymore. So things change so often, just being so much more involved in, in learning and continuing to grow and apply new principles into your practice whenever possible will help you not become stagnant as an existing practitioner. Yeah. And then one that one that's existing, but um, what was the last category you said? Well, let, let me get to that because I'm, I'm thinking that if you're willing, I might want to have you back on at some point to, to talk about the Apex Seminar ecosystem mm -hmm. and then talk about some of the strategies that you guys recommend for people in practice who want to get into it, but they're they're already busy doing other things. And, and I know that that's one of the biggest challenges. And docs and seminars ask me all the time, like, I'm so busy. I can't see how I can fit it, but it's what I really want to do. But I can't step away from what's paying the bills. And so I think there are some unique challenges. And if if you're willing, I'd love to have you back on to go through all that kind of stuff. Um, sure. The last category was, what about someone who's doing functional medicine who's struggling to make it work? Either, you know, struggling either clinically, they're just not getting results that they're they're hoping for, or they're struggling from a, like a business standpoint, they just kind of can't launch it or can't get it off the ground. I think there's a number of people that are struggling from a business standpoint. And I think they, they actually approach their, their practice um, as kind of an apologetic approach. Like they're not, they're apologetic that it's going to cost X amount of dollars to do this. Uh, and I think that's a real mistake because you're offering a service uh, and the, that service costs a, a fee and yeah. how much is your health worth? I think the people that struggle financially in functional medicine uh, don't come with enough confidence that they just say, this is what it costs. And believe me, it will help you. You know, I think that that that's an issue that many doctors um, run into is, is not being assured and being apologetic for charging Thirty dollars for a bottle of uh, of uh, nutrients that, uh, or fifty dollars for a bottle of nutrients that really have an effect on them. Uh, as far as uh, the, them not being successful in in their practice part of it, I think that's again education and partnering with the right practitioners to help them understand how to clinically apply those principles. Yeah. At Apex, we get a group of doctors together at a at a conference. They become kind of like a a little team together and they communicate with each other what's working, what's not working, how we implement it, what we do and so on. So I think that an ongoing conversation with practitioners, like-minded practitioners is a really important thing. That's why, you know, and last I'll just say this, that's why I think in-person education is so important. Doctors are seeing patients and they're giving, giving, giving constantly to their patients. They're, they're giving everything they have to help their patients get better. They sometimes have to get together with other like-minded doctors and kind of fill their own emotional bucket. Yeah. And when you get together in, a, in an event, shoulder to shoulder with like-minded people learning the same things, it's exciting. And it, and it, it provides a, a, a amount of purpose and, and excitement and, and so on. So I think, um, I don't know how I, I think I went off on a little bit of a tangent. No, there. no, it's all, listen, it's all, it's all relevant because the whole point of this podcast is, is to start um, talking to industry leaders, top clinicians, researchers, um, you know, directors of labs, supplement companies, because, you know, we all live in our own little bubble, right? And, and you have, obviously, you have this concept of mastermind groups that's been around for a very, very long time. And the reason why they work is because you have to expose yourself to new ways of thinking and new ways of doing things, or else you you will eventually hit a rut and you hit some kind of an obstacle that you just simply can't get past. So I know I, I take what you say with, uh, I mean, I'm listening. <laughs> I'm listening uh -huh. to what you say. Uh, 
So listen, I, I know we're, we're just over an hour. So final questions here. Um, what are you most proud of in your career? Um, I'm proud of what we did at Metagenics. I'm proud of um, uh, how we helped pave the way for functional medicine in some aspect of it. And uh, I'm proud of all the interactions of the people that I've had, the relationships that I've had, the influence that I've had. You know, I often say to them, I've had, you know, maybe up to a thousand salespeople that have worked under me at one time or another. And I, I've always said this to them, you know, just think we have an opportunity uh, in our career to educate doctors on different compounds or different aspects to help them be more effective than their patient yep. uh, with their patients. What better career or what better goal could you have in a job than helping yep. people help their patients get healthy. I'm really proud of that interaction. Yeah. And th that's one thing I love about teaching is that I, I can only help so many people by myself, but if I can help even a dozen other docs become the best clinicians that they can be, then I, I help not only my patients, but I help all theirs as well. Um, in the same vein, like what, what would you different do differently? If you could go back at any point in your career, what would you change? I think what I would um, do is I would take more advantage of the opportunities that I had at hand. I had so many opportunities and I, I took, I took um, advantage as many as I, as I could at the time. But in retrospect, I could have taken more advantage of learning opportunities, learning opportunities about learning more about business, learning more about um, uh, the practice of functional medicine from a clinician standpoint, not just a salesperson standpoint. Uh, you know, we we will detail doctors on the research about a particular compound, but really don't understand how that translates into patient conversations, how it translates to patient outcomes. So I, I could have taken more advantage of the opportunities to learn more. Um, yeah. And so I, in retrospect, I would have done that. Yeah, I would imagine in, in the positions that you've held over the years and what you've been exposed to that you've probably amassed a certain a pretty decent knowledge of human physiology as well as the nutrients and what they do in the body. But you're right. I mean, the, tr the translation into clinical practice is not necessarily an easy one. And you can have two different docs that have the same knowledge base, but their ability to talk to clients and help them modify their behaviors can be radically different, which is eventually something else that we'll be talking about on the podcast as well, because I want, I, like literally, I want to talk about the entire spectrum of functional medicine practice, which is not just about knowing physiology and knowing what tools are available to you. It's about working with real people who live in the real world with real problems and, and being that guide and that coach that helps them make the changes that they need to make and doing it without driving yourself nuts and burning out and, uh, you know, maintain, maintaining some kind of life balance on your own. Right. Now, right. Speaking That's of that, it. final question, what does Tim Kaki do in his time off? Uh, I am an avid golfer, so I love to golf. And um, uh, older I get, the more difficult it becomes. But I'm still, uh, I'm still in uh, trying to get into single di single digit handicap. Um, you know, I have a I have a really good uh, community um, that I work with and and associate with. And my wife and I just love to travel. You know, Italy is our the Amalfi Coast is our favorite place place in the world to be. Nice. And uh, so we love to to travel as much as we can and so on. Um, so. I, you know, I still, to this day, just get really excited about learning, and I'm still learning every day, uh, different aspects that I learned from Dr. Krasi and at Apex, you know, things I learned in, in other aspects. So I'm an, uh, I'm just an avid learner, and I just continue to love to do that. Yeah, I, I can't, re I can't remember the last time I read a book just simply for pleasure. Yeah, <laughs> we, we we went to Cabo in December, and I read a book for pleasure there. So Did you good for you? Sit next to the pool. Yeah, that was nice. There you go. Why you're talking about life balance right there? Yeah, you go. Well, Tim, listen, listen. I I truly appreciate you being on over the last oh seven eight years that you and I have known each other. You've become a friend and and uh, way more than just a colleague. And uh, your time and your insights are appreciated. And please come back on and let's. Let's make that happen. And we'll talk a little bit more about other aspects of what you do and how that affects what I do. Right. Well, great. Thank you. Be happy to do that. And, and thank you for what you do. You're, you're an extraordinary doc and, and I really appreciate all that you do. Well, thank you, brother. Appreciate it very much. Okay. Thanks. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.